um, Rochelle O'Brien. I currently work at the University of Liverpool as an educational developer um, and will soon be moving to Durham University. Um, so, yeah, that's me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to post a link in the chat because I don't do PowerPoint. I'm, I'm not very good at delivering from a PowerPoint because I feel like there's too much attention on me, which is really weird because I'm now going to just keep the attention on me. I realise that's back to front, but um, I have created a little bit of an escape room because I figure I'm going to talk to you about video games. Might as well give you the chance to play one. So this is going to be a little bit different. So I'm sorry about that if you're expecting to come in. Just listen. You can do that if that's what you want to do. You don't have to join in. Uh, but if you do want to join in, you do need to listen closely because I'm going to be giving you the clues to the passwords in the things that I say. And what I'd really, really like before I get started is if you could say hi, maybe use a GIF or an emoji. Um, you don't have to again, by all means, just sit there and have a little rest on this Thursday morning. Have you guys got clouds too? I've got them. Rachel, sorry, just before you continue, um, I'm I'm not um, able to see the chat. Um, okay. Chat function. I'm just going to post the link on Twitter as well. Thanks, Thank Christians. you very much. It's like having a glamorous assistant. This, I like it. <laughs> not that glamorous. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm loving it. We've got actual like animal gifts. So sorry that you can't see the chat. There are animal gifts happening. Um, actually like partaking in the escape room won't, it's not going to mean that you get any more from the actual session right now, but it's something that you can take away and it'll give you a bit of information to look back on of what I've talked about. So what I'm going to start by doing while you're all putting your gifts in, um, I'm sorry if I keep randomly laughing, I think, have I just got a Mrs Doubtfire? That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so. I, as I said, I work as an educational developer at the University of Liverpool and I use video games quite a lot and games in teaching. That's where my interest is and sort of where my speciality is developing. It's quite a personal thing for me. Um, I've got a, a nephew who's neurodiverse um, and he's amazing and he learns a hell of a lot more from video games than he does from formal education. It's very complex, but in seeing that, I kind of thought to myself, OK, maybe there's an opportunity here. Maybe we can use video games to level the playing field a little bit for those people who maybe can't learn using a traditional curriculum. So because of that, I decided to go and play some video games and see if I could learn anything. First thing I learned, I really don't like competition. It really, really doesn't suit me at all. Um, so. I played FIFA and I won a game and that felt great. But then I was like, yeah, but I'm just chasing a ball around a field. Don't really like this. So I decided to play World of Warcraft and I went into it and I was thinking, OK, um, this is fighting bad guys. I don't particularly like fighting things. I kind of changed my mind on that. Fighting bad guys is really cool. It makes you not think about anything else. So while I was playing all of these different types of games, I was kind of looking at things and thinking, OK, what kind of things are these employing that we may be able to use in education? So there's some really cool things that I've come up with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to gradually talk you through them. So I've given you a little bit of information about me. Have you all put the let's go password in? We've all moved on. I'm going to look at the only people I can see who are nodding and assume you all have. OK, so if you're ready, let's go. So first thing I'm going to talk to you about is the difference between play and games. Now, this might sound a little bit random because, you know, do you really need to know? I think it's kind of useful. So play is something that's done for the sake of it. And literally the only purpose of it is to do it. So you may not notice that time is passing by um, and generally you just enjoy what you're doing, but you don't necessarily have a set of rules, so there's no purpose. It's kind of something that you may think I don't really do much of. And I think it's interesting that 
play seems to be lost a little bit in adulthood. It's kind of a shame as well. It's really cool if you can remember how to play. And I think if you have children or if you have children in your life, you're often catapulted back into that need to remember how to do it. And it feels really, really awkward if you're anything like me. Um, but you kind of get used to it. And then you kind of get to a point, if you're like me, where you end up borrowing your nieces and nephews so that you can go to the forest and go dragon hunting because why would you not want to do that on a Saturday afternoon? So that's play. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the point at which that morphs. So the point at which you add a rule or you add some element like competition, which I know I've already said I don't really like, um, that's the point when it starts to become a game. So games tend to have logic, they have conflict, they're interactive, so they involve somebody else, they have rules, and they tend to be a problem-solving pursuit with a playful attitude. And this is kind of the point where I started thinking, okay, this sounds a little bit like education, because quite often we'll give students a problem and we'll say to them, here's a problem, go solve it. So if we're doing that anyway, why not make it fun? Because surely if somebody's laughing, they're going to remember what they're doing. So this is kind of the logic I'm going with. And as you will see, if you are getting to the bottom of this page, you need a password. So I've already told you that I don't really like competition. And I've told you that I play World of Warcraft. So my favourite type of game is an adventure game. Did, did you get the password? <laughs> see, do you see what we're doing? This is what we're doing. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the holding power of games because I don't, this is probably the thing that you want to know a little bit more about. So games are often described as having holding power and you've probably seen articles in the press about how kids can't get off their games and they're constantly on the games consoles and there's always loads of really negative language around it around the fact that people are addicted and I'm not going to go into the addiction thing don't worry but there's it's often described as being a way of holding attention so it's sometimes described as a hypnotic fascination but again if we sort of think about education you could kind of think well maybe this is just extreme engagement Maybe somebody's like so into it, they're doing, do, just keep doing it because they don't want to stop. But what happens if we do that in education? Like, is there a way that we can take that thing that video games are doing that makes you want to play more and put it into learning and then be like, OK, you've got all these students and they really, really want to learn and they're so excited about learning. They want to do more. So this is the thing that really, really sort of struck my attention. And I was thinking, OK, well, the kinds of things games are doing is they're making challenges that are kind of just that little bit too hard so that you feel like you're going to fail. But then sometimes you win. And when you win, that's really, really exciting. So then when you have that excited feeling and you feel that rush of emotions and like pleasure that you've one or you've achieved something it makes you want to move forward and I think there's a bit of confusion sometimes over this being um, a feeling of like addiction and needing to do more but I think when you break it down a little bit and when you read into the literature as deep as I have it ends up looking a bit different because you're thinking to yourself well actually this is enjoyable somebody's just doing something that they enjoy and they're doing it a lot and yeah some people may not may not like that but is that a really bad thing if it makes you happy so based on this again I start looking towards education and thinking okay so this sounds a little bit similar to Vygotsky's more knowledgeable other and that I think we've lost sound.
I've just heard you, Chris, so maybe it's just frozen. Yeah. Uh, Kel, are you still there? Okay, we'll, we'll give it a couple of seconds to see. Uh, it might just be a, a temporary issue. Um... So she's still in the call. So I've just sent her a message. Um... Yeah, I think she just dropped off. So she might be back on in a moment. Ah, the joy of using technology, right? So, um... Oh, while, yeah, we wait, while we sorry wait for about that. Oh, we're back. We're back. Sorry, I'll leave my webcam off. So, um, I'm going to tell you about my brother and then I'll move on, I promise. So, um, I used to watch my brother play video games um, and he used to be really, really smart about it because he used to say to me, I'll let you play when I lose. So, I was like, oh yeah, great, fair enough. What he didn't say to me is, I also play for 15 hours a day, so the chances of me losing are really, really remote. So, yeah, you can sit and watch me. So I ended up spending a lot of my childhood sitting, hopefully waiting for him to, to fail, which sounds like a pretty boring childhood, doesn't it? But there came to a point where I was like, OK, this is really boring sitting watching him play. I want to make this fun. So what I decided to do was I decided to watch how he was winning. So I started figuring out how he was winning by watching him play even though I wasn't doing it myself. And then when it actually came to my turn, I just used the things he was doing to win. And then I won, which meant he didn't get to play. So he then realized that I'd managed to turn the tables on him because his plan on not letting me play his game was completely backfiring. So the clue you're looking for is the game that he was playing, Sonic. Any of you guys ever play Sonic? Do you remember this? For yes. a large amount of time, yeah. He um he was so good that he managed to do Green Hill Zone Act One, I think it's called, in 29 seconds. That was his like claim to fame. He once played for so long that he had a seizure and my mum had to take him to hospital. So yeah, don't play Sonic for like 20 hours in a day, it's not good for you. So that's a little bit about the holding power of games. So why games? So it's really great to start to notice these things. And hopefully from what I've said, you have started to see where there may be similarities between the kind of things that video games are doing and the kind of things we're trying to achieve in education and how it can like cross over a little bit. So I think oftentimes it's, um, it's tempting to say, OK, uh, let's just make a game for our class. And that sounds really big and a bit scary. So I'm a massive advocate of taking a small bit of a class and trying to add some principles you might learn from a game. Now, this could be a video game or it could be a board game. I think the best place to start is to take your favourite game and think, OK, this is my favourite element of my favourite game and try and apply that and do it in small parts. And the best features are things such as problem solving and using a backstory and a narrative flow and tasks that can incite intrinsic motivation in students and maybe giving them roles so they can play out different characters and creating decision frameworks which can be impacted and controlled by the player. So. Basically, if we give students the opportunity to take risks in a really safe environment, give them a few tools that's going to mean that they succeed and give them a problem to solve, you're basically applying video game principles to learning. And hopefully we can kind of move towards that holding power that I talked about. So this all sounds great, doesn't it? But you know, in reality, when you're doing it, it can be a little bit scary and I'm one of those people who really, really likes to deliver education and feel like I'm in control because, you know, 
we have objectives, we have things that people need to leave with at the end of the day. And if they're not met, then what happens? Now, it's taken me a long, long time to get to the point where I've realised that sometimes you can plan beforehand and go into a session and deliver and not know what the outcome is going to be. But that's OK. So if you can get yourself to the point and this is quite hard to do because it feels like a conscious effort for me so I imagine it's going to be the same for others where you feel comfortable with chaos um, that is a very very good place to be at and you find when you get to the point where you're comfortable with chaos that that's where the magic happens so I delivered a session recently uh, where I was training some senior managers how to use Microsoft Teams and I went into it and I approached it as an escape room and I thought this is going to be amazing or it's going to fail. There's no in between here. Let's hope for the best. And I realised that they had features of Teams turned off that I didn't know they had turned off. And I was like, oh, my God, this is really, really bad. Um, but what happened was they figured out how to do the task they had to do a different way, a way that I didn't even know existed. And I was like, OK, I couldn't have planned for this. I didn't know that didn't exist, but I didn't know that way existed, but now I do. I'm just going to pretend I meant for them to find out that way and hope for the best. Um, and what actually happened was they went beyond what I'd done and started cheating so that they could do it faster and win. And in cheating, they were actually getting to that point where they felt they could take risks and be more comfortable with the software in that specific example. And that was great. So. The final thing I was going to say is that I have tried to put together a few things that might help you if you decide you want to get started with using some games or game elements in teaching. So there's just a list in the end one and it's basically keeping it simple. Start with a spark or an idea and, you know, follow that through. If you're feeling confident, layer complexity. So make it more complex once you're really really confident with your idea but make sure you're keeping it simple because if you can't explain what you're trying to do in a sentence the chances are the person who's trying to do it isn't going to get it and um, check and make sure it makes sense find some willing subjects to give it a try out and you can use this as a learning opportunity for you as much as students and I think the most important thing with all of this, it can be good fun. It can be good fun for you delivering it. It can be good fun for those taking part. It can be really chaotic, as I've mentioned, but you can find some real gold in that chaos. And I'm not suggesting that you do this for everything, but do what you're comfortable with. I think that's the most important. If you go into something excited and feeling comfortable and happy, and you're willing to just sort of take a chance and treat it as an opportunity to laugh, then just see what happens. What is the worst that can happen? With that, um, I'm finished, so I, I can take any questions if you've got any, but what I'd like you to do in the chat is just tell me what your favourite game is or what your favourite feature of a game is like are you like me do you hate competition as well or do you really love it do you thrive off that i can see there's loads of stuff for me to catch up on in the chat but yeah i'll take Brilliant. questions thank you um so does anybody have any questions just throw up, uh, put the hands up if you do or type it into the chat of course siobhan Siobhan, are you on mute? OK, I'll start again. Uh, yes, I really like the distinction you made between play and games. I'm re listening to an audio book at the moment, uh, which I'll post the link to here, called uh, Free Play, which sort of uh, touches a bit on that. And um, uh, and it talks yeah, about how play can uh, loosen up and allow people to reach their potential and it was games which bring up all the things you mentioned at the, at the start of your talk 
And the other thing I wanted to mention as well, just to give a shout out to someone from uh, University of Lincoln School of Geography. They also did where they devised games with students. So they got students to uh, create games and the point was to encourage them to engage in design thinking so they know the rules of the game. So this was the paper they wrote on it, which was about uh, sustainability. And if uh, anyone has any tips on how to build games uh, digitally in a relatively easy way for non-computing people, please post it in the chat as well, as the game will have to move from physical to digital. Game but yeah, I studio. really uh, like the talk and I like the distinction between uh, game and all that entails and play. I can see that a couple of people have mentioned about escape rooms and the way that I've given you sort of learning materials there. Um, that's a really, really simple and effective way of doing it. And I know you've just said about for those people who maybe aren't computing and don't necessarily have the skills to develop a game. Um, that escape room is made in OneNote, which is a product that you will probably have within your Microsoft license. It also sits within Microsoft Teams. Um, as long as you've got a subject and you can make a real clear sort of path through and understand the logic yourself there's no, no reason why anyone can't do that it's a case of password protecting pages so it, it's one of those things where it's like kind of simple but an effective way of keeping somebody moving along with you rather than just look at my slides i think in, in this era of sort of online everything it if you can give somebody something they can do themselves and will empower them to join in in that way, it's not a bad thing. It's just giving everybody a different type of access to hopefully include more people. <laughs> Brilliant. I love that. Just chaos in capital letters. That's basically <laughs> me. 